chapter 18. <clears throat> could you imagine if the Lord decided not to show us grace? Serious, could you imagine if he decided we did not need grace? We didn't get it. Nope. Could you imagine where we would be without his grace? <clears throat> Matthew chapter 18, starting in verse number 21. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. By the way, this is Christ, the Savior, God Almighty, who is speaking. And keep in mind in context here, I'm not going to go into all this, but this section here, if you remember, as we went through the book of Matthew, we went through this was a couple years ago. We were here. This is going back 2017, not 18, actually. Um, when we were coming through all this, I'm going I'm to touch on one aspect here, of, and that being forgiveness. He is now addressing church issues. He has been since Matthew chapter 16. All right? Matthew chapter 16, that began. He has just finished talking about church discipline, and that's the context of this. All right? And he goes on to say this. Therefore, he gives a parable to explain what he just meant by um, 70 times 7. Therefore, is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him that owed him 10,000 talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife, and his children, and all that he had, and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Here's grace. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion, and loosed him, and forgave him the debt. But the same servant, now he wanted grace from that Lord, but he had trouble showing it to others. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not. But went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desiredest me. Shouldest not thou have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth, and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Let's go ahead and pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word. We ask your blessing upon the service tonight. We pray that you be glorified and honored in all that's said and done. Please direct the speech. I pray you'd use this to draw us closer to you. Lord, we know that we do need your grace and your mercy. We pray for your help. And, and Lord, we thank you in, in, in how you will work in our lives. Draw us closer to you. Use this, Lord, uh, to, to be a help. Again, Lord, I love you, and I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. As I've already mentioned, this is in the context of church discipline. He has just finished giving out the four-step process of how we handle church discipline. It's in this light that Peter comes before the Lord and he asks the question, how often should I forgive my brother? And Peter throws out what he perceived to be a very spiritual number, actually, when he said seven times. Because the Pharisees taught, based in the book of Amos chapter 2, that you, would, you forgive three times. But on the fourth time, mm -mm, it ends. On the fourth time, it's over with. And so Peter more than doubled that. He thinks he's being spiritual. He knows what he's been taught. And he knows Christ has just been showing compassion and how to handle the church discipline. He understood it. So he's, he's trying to follow, if you will, even the pattern that Christ has been given. He said, shall I forgive? how often shall I forgive my brother that trespasses against me? Seven times? And Christ comes back with that answer. No, no. Seventy times seven. 490 times. What he meant, we're going to see, is basically unending. 
<clears throat> From there, he goes on to give a parable that would be the, a, a foundational to understanding forgiveness and why what Christ, what he just said is true, the 70 times 7. Peter, as many of us do, misunderstood forgiveness. Christ is now trying to get him to understand it. And we all know forgiveness is a key to any successful relationship. Whether, whether it's with each other, here as a church, if we're going to be successful as a church, forgiveness is going to be part. We're going to have offenses between each other and our church. That's going to take place. And if forgiveness isn't part of it, you have division in the church. You have, this person won't talk to this person. Everything gets misconstrued. Forgiveness is essential. We all have a sin nature. We won't be successful apart from it. All right? And, and so he's dealing with that concept here. And, of course, we certainly need it. Um, forgiveness is essential for any healthy relationship to take place. <clears throat> so, one of our problems is forgiveness goes against our nature and what we want. We like vengeance. That's what we like. We like, we like revenge. We, we, we want to, the tit for tat, remember, that, and that's, that's common. I don't, I don't, okay. it's, there's not a person in here that's exempt from that. None of us. That, that's in our nature to have that. And, you, and we have to be careful with that because the Bible is clear. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Let God handle that. He knows exactly how to do it. You don't. Remember when I, I brought this up probably several, four or five times over the years. When preparing to go to New Guinea, I was reading the story of Chalmers, who was the very first missionary into the country of New Guinea, um, going back to the 19th century. And uh, when you read about the guy, the guy was, somehow he managed to learn seven of the tribal languages, which is just, that, that was of God to have the ability to do that. I mean, really, that was just completely of the Lord to learn seven tribal. These are unwritten, they're difficult, limited vocabularies, and he learned seven of them. And in the seven he learned, he found a common denominator that he wrote about. No word for forgiveness. Think about that. When, and, and just think about that in relation to how, what a language says about a culture. It demonstrates how a culture thinks. The concept of forgiveness wasn't present. And vengeance was huge. It still is when I was there. Um, payback. I mean, that, that was huge when I was there. Um, it, was, it was a way of living. Revenge. That's what you did. Th there were times we had to stop it. I've told the story of coming back. I'd carried a, a baby had just died. A lady had just put her faith in Christ at the work in Kudu Kudu. And uh, she was not, she was pregnant. Uh, she was nine months pregnant. The baby died in the room. She had to wait several weeks because there's for the baby to, she knew the baby had died. And finally, she was able to go up five hours to our capital of the province in Cavian and, and, and deliver the baby. And she showed up at the house about 9.30 at night with the dead baby. By this time, the baby had been dead in the womb for a couple of weeks, and now it's been several days, and she had it. And I was, I was still getting over malaria. It's about the last day of it, though. And she asked if she can get a ride back out to the village. And so she's sitting in the back seat holding the dead baby. I get in, I get in the car, and I'm driving out there, and I just stopped to... I had to stop and vomit. I don't know what's a polite word to say from the pulpit on there. Um, one time, just because the smell of the dead body, along with just getting over malaria, just wasn't a good mix. And so get out there, and I'm heading back. It's about midnight by the time I'm heading back, um, back home. And we're going to do the funeral about 6 a.m. the next morning. And uh, um, so uh, I'm heading back, and as I'm coming through Sohon, which is about 30 minutes coming back, I came up over a hill, and little did I know there was men on each side of the road waiting for me. I had no idea. They're in the bush. I couldn't see them, but they just started stoning my car as I came through. And uh, no, nothing broke or came through. It wasn't hurt at all, just the loud banging and everything like that. It'll, it'll wake you up when you're driving, because that, by that time, it's about 1230 <laughs> at that time. So I was awake all the way home for it. So it was a nice alarm clock. And I, I got back, to, and the next day, when the, after the funeral, the men in, in, at the church and so on had found out what happened. And so I had to go back out there and say, no, no, we're not doing anything right now. I mean, they were ready to show some payback. And I said, no, no, we're not doing anything. There, there's nothing. No, we have to do something. No, we don't. We don't have to do anything right now. We're not going to do anything about it right now. And uh, it, the, that concept was strong. So, in our text here, Christ deals with it, especially in our relationships with each other. 
uh, um, on the idea of forgiveness. Peter really isn't still, it's, it was one of Peter's problems. He wasn't really responding here with humility. Isn't it interesting how Peter words the question? Look how he words this. It's, it's not humorous, but it, let me see. How often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? <laughs> Till seven times. You can still see a bit of a lack of humility here with Peter just yet because he didn't ask, how long should my brother forgive me when I offend him? <laughs> it's the other guy who's going to be offending him. All right? I guess, so you can see a little bit of that here. But nonetheless, I think, I think Peter's intent with the question is right. I, I think he's trying to seek something that's really good and right right here. And, and uh, so Peter's trying to come up with an amount. It's sort of how he was taught. And so he comes out with, all right, seven times is this it. Let me put a number to it, Lord. How many times should I forgive? He wants an amount. He wants to calculate it. But forgiveness, this is the first point, is not a calculation. It's an attitude. It's not a calculation. Look at it like this. This is a very good way to look at it. How many times should you be in awe when you look at creation? Ten? Is that enough? Twelve? How many times should you honor God? How many times should you show kindness? How many times should you love your children? Uh, about ten with that one. What would that out then? Obviously, none of those have an amount. They're not calculations. Do you understand forgiveness is in that same group? It's not a number. It's not a calculation. It's not, okay, this is where you got to, we're done. That's not it. That's not how that works. Uh, uh, Watson put it this way. I like his wording. It's much better than mine. Let me go to his wording with this. I'll I'll quote from him. He said, forgiveness is a simple state of mind, like admiration of God's creation for which all of man needs in a sense of beauty and order in his nature. Forgiveness is a state of heart, just as affection or sympathy is. And no man thinks of determining how often and how far he must feel sympathy, or how often and how far he must love those who are dear to him. The sympathy is always there. The love is always in the heart, and it requires only to be appealed to and touched to come forth. You cannot imagine a man of genuine tenderness of heart making up his mind and calculating whether he should feel pity for a cause of distress or not. You could not imagine a friend debating with himself whether he would sympathize with his friend in some calamity. Sympathy is free and spontaneous. It does not come and go at one's call. The point he was teaching on is the same text that I'm in was forgiveness. It's not a calculation. It's an attitude. It's an attitude towards others. It's a choice to forgive. And then, to elaborate on this, Christ goes into the parable. He goes into the parable of this man here who had this tremendous debt. 10,000 talents. Now, this man, obviously, to be in debt this much, he had to be some type of prince, something. Um, to give you an idea of how much money we're dealing with, at this time, the entire revenue for the countries of Judea, Samaria, uh, Idumea was 600 talents. Combined. Combined. The total revenue in Galilee, 300 talents. 10 thousand talents is a ridiculous sum of money. The lowest amount I found and was ten million dollars in US dollars. But that was the lowest. The majority, the overwhelming majority all said you're in the hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars with this. And there was one one commentator and again, I don't know, because it was only one, I don't know that I would put a whole lot of faith in this. Uh, um, and I've never read it any other, anywhere else in any of my other studies. But nonetheless, I found it interesting that he said it. I just wish he would have sourced it so I could have went back and sourced it. But he said this. He said, even, even the reason why Christ used 10,000 here, he said, because at this time, 10,000 was considered the highest number. <clears throat> 
So, the reason Christ gave this number of 10,000 talents was to show a debt that could never be repaid. Never. It's too great. A debt that could never be repaid. The fact is your sin is so great before God, you could never repay him. It's not possible. It's not possible. Religion calls out just like this man did. Just just let me, I'll repay all. That's religion speaking. Religion can never repay the debt. It's not possible. This man, had he been free, could never ever repay that debt. It wasn't possible. But religion says, oh, I can repay, I can repay. That will never take place. You will never repay that debt. Our only hope for that debt, we have one hope and that is it, and that's forgiveness. That's it. The only hope we have with the debt that we owe God is for God to say, it's forgiven. And the fact is, God freely forgives us because of what Jesus Christ did on Calvary. You think about that. The tremendous debt that we owed him. And then what he was willing to do to put himself in a place where he could, with justice, with holiness, forgive you. And that was by him becoming a man. Humbling himself, putting on uh, on this robe of flesh, walking on this sin-cursed earth. Everything that was going on all around him, enduring all of that as the creator of the universe. And then going to the cross and becoming sin for us. God was doing all that so he could get to the place to forgive your debt, which you could never repay. You have no no hope apart from this. You need to understand the debt that you owed God was just as much as this 10,000 talents. No hope. That if God does not choose forgiveness, there is nothing you can do about it. So now, this is what Christ is using to teach Peter forgiveness in relation to others. When someone offends us, regardless of the offense, it cannot compare to our own own offense before God. It cannot. And in the parable, Christ elaborates on that. This man, he heads out, he goes and finds someone who owes him a a fairly good amount, the equivalent of 10 days worth of wages. He heads out, what verse is it here? Um, But the same servant went out, verse 28, and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him 100 pence. All right, this is, again, that's for a guy making a decent living at that time frame. That's about 100 days worth of income. Three to four months worth of income is what this man owes him. So it's, it's a decent amount, but it is something that can be paid back. <clears throat> it's, not, it's not the debt like this man owed, which was just not even possible for him to pay back. So he goes and he finds somebody that he knows. The man owes him 100 days of wages. He had absolutely no mercy. The guy says almost the same words that he did. Please have mercy on me. I will repay thee. Now understand, that man saying that, he actually can repay it. He has no mercy. He has no compassion. And he has him thrown in prison. He could have him thrown in debtor's prison, which is what he did. We read this and think, what a horrible person. Yet this is how God sees us when we fail to show forgiveness and grace to others. All that he was willing to do to forgive our sin, the debt that we could never repay, none of us could never repay. And yet, we way too often have the same attitude towards others. Again, compared to the debt that this man owed the other Lord, 
the debt this other man had towards him was nothing. Always keep in mind what God has done for you. You have that fresh, it is a key to forgiveness. It's key to understanding, wait, wait, look, look what God has done for me. Next, we see this. The lack of forgiveness, in this case, this is important, led God to turn the man over to the tormentors. That's exactly what the Lord will do to you. He will turn you over to the tormentors. <clears throat> you will suffer, not others. You'll be the one bothered by it. You'll be the person that's dealing with that and holding on to that and the hurt and the grudging and all that's taking place, the mind games, the bitterness. You will be the one that has been given over to the tormentors. One pastor, he had, he had put it like this. This was sort of a, almost an entire message. I'm going I'm to sum it up. And I liked, how he had, I liked how he had presented it. He put it in three stages, forgiveness. He says there's three stages. The suffering, the surgery, and starting over. First off, not all wrongs need forgiveness. All right? That's not true. Not all wrongs need forgiveness. Sometimes people just need to, need to grow up. Forgiveness is definitely essential when there's actual hurt in place. Okay? But not all wrongs need forgiveness. Some people really just need to grow up and get chip off their shoulder. Um, in some cases, not any law. I, I've given this example out a few times before. It, it fits perfectly. I was 23, 24 years old, the youth pastor at my church. And uh, Sunday evening service, I was at the altar praying, and, and this uh, one of the ladies in the church came up and started praying right next to me. And I was like, I mean, really, really close. <laughs> and it was awkward anyhow. And she said she had to talk to me real quick. We're down by the office. She said, I need you to forgive me. And I had no idea she have, had, there was anything between, at all. I was clueless. And I said, well, I, I don't understand. And she said, well, I've been, I've been mad at you, bitter against you. She goes, I don't think you ever should have been selected as youth pastor. Her husband was the former youth pastor's assistant. So when he left, he was military and got PCS'd out. She had felt her husband should have became the youth pastor. When the pastor had come to me and asked me to take the youth. So she had gotten, her husband was fine with it, by the way. We, we were good, but she did not. She never got, she didn't get over that. She thought he should have been selected for it. And she said, listen, I'm sorry. She never should have come to me. I wasn't hurt or injured. I wasn't offended. I knew nothing of it. Now I was offended. <laughs> no. But she did not need to come to me in that case. I was not aware of it. It was private. There was nobody else involved. This was a case where forgiveness wasn't needed by me. Before the Lord, yes. She needed to bring that before God and get forgiveness. But she did not need my forgiveness. <clears throat> But anyhow, suffering is the first stage. Suffering obviously involves where a, a hurt has taken place. You're dealing with something, a moral issue, a, a, an injury, a hurt, a betrayal, unrighteousness, disloyalty. I can go on and on, but there's an injury that has taken place. Suffering has occurred. The next stage is surgery. The tough part about this one is you have to be your own surgeon. You're your own. God's word, God's spirit, he directs and he certainly helps. He wants to give the power and the ability to do it. But you have to be your own surgeon. What you have to do is work on that wound. You've got to be able to cut that thing out. Um, you've got to be able to go in there and start to cut out that unforgiveness and sew that wound up. All right? And that's something that the Lord directs. It's something that he does as you yield yourself unto him. He gives the ability to do just that. <clears throat> And then it's starting over. You've got to look at it as a new day, a fresh start. Now, let me, let's make this clear. You don't, I've heard it preached, and they'll use, they'll, they'll use out of the book of Lamentations, um, a few different sources, but we're dealing with God there, not man. You don't forget. That's just simply not true. You have those who say, listen, I, I've, I completely forgot. When there's an actual injury that takes place, you're not going to forget that. I'm not going to say if you're super spiritual and you're walking with God, you're not even going to remember it. That's simply not true. <clears throat> you're going to remember it. Um, but when you remember it, what you begin to rejoice in is the forgiveness. 
it's not excusing the sin. It's knowing it was wrong. And they certainly are to blame for it. But you have to rejoice in the forgiveness. And the reality is there still will be pain at times. That's a reality. <clears throat> we could try and paint it different as super spiritual. And all of a sudden, if you, if you demonstrate it and all the pain's gone, you don't remember it. That's just simply not true. You have a flesh. It's still going to come to mind. And when it does, there's going to be that cringe of that hurt that's going to be present. But then it's rejoicing in the forgiveness. There is danger in unforgiveness. Look over in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. This is another case of, similar to what we see in Matthew, dealing with the idea of church discipline. Um, and where the church had did right by exercising church discipline because the man was not showing repentance. But now repentance is being demonstrated. And they don't want to forgive. So Paul addresses that. Verse 7. So Connorwise, you ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Wherefore, I beseech you that you would confirm your love towards him. For to this end also did I write, that I might know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things. To whom, now get this, 10, 11 is the key. To whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgive anything to whom I forgave it, for you yourselves forgave I in the, in the person of Christ. Now, notice the punctuation right there. He continues. The next verse is one we often quote, but it's in context of unforgiveness. Verse 11. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Listen, there's a danger there. Unforgiveness can put you in a place where, put you in a place where Satan takes advantage of your life. Don't be ignorant of his devices. He can put you in a place where it, you can, he can take advantage because unforgiveness is... We quote verse 11 all the time, but the context is unforgiveness. And again, here's the guy, he's showing repentance, and Paul's saying, listen, okay, forgive him, love him, let him back in. The requirement for that was what? Repentance. Repentance. <clears throat> So, continue on with the danger. You open yourself up for Satan to take advantage. How does he take advantage? Well, usually it's going to be through, the, one of the first ways it's going to demonstrate itself is going to be through anger. All right? Anger. You have to understand, what's, what, 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 can, what can he do to a life that is holding on to uh, a lack of forgiveness? Anger will come into play. Um, we can go through, I'm not going to go through this, uh, you know, but you can go through the Bible and where anger is at the top of so many Sins. It's, it's amazing. It's, you go through list of sins in the Bible, many times you're going to find pride and anger at the very top. <clears throat> Everybody loves an angry person. They're so much fun. When you find an angry person, you found a person, I mean, there can be a lot of reasons for it biblically, I'm not going to go to all of them, but many times one of the traits that can lead to that is a person who does not forgive. Many times wives and children have to put up with an angry husband and dad. The fact is, anger will begin to eat at you. It changes how you view that precious life God has given you. Don't let anger fill you. If anger isn't dealt with, it grows far worse. It gets to a point of bitterness. The anger will turn to bitterness. If it's not repented of, you're opening yourself up to a great poison. Bitterness is a horrible place to live. It ruins your life. It wants to occupy your time, your thoughts, your actions. According to Romans chapter 3 and verse 14, it affects your speech. How you talk. 
your words. I'm going to read that verse. I'm trying to remember the wording of it, I can't. Yes. Yeah, I was going through the context of our sin nature. The Romans chapter 3 said this. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. You can hear it in the speech of the person. Not only that, and I've, and I've preached on this before in a message on bitterness. Where's that at over here? <clears throat> Looking, verse 15 of Hebrews 12. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. It's something that certainly will defile you. It will take over your life, and it will lead to trouble, as that verse says. I've seen this example many times. The clearest was a relative that I had who had a, a tremendous hurt that had come in. Um, husband had, the husband had left her and, and uh, had married somebody else and, and, um, and fairly young age. I don't think they were married all that long. I really don't remember. I was very young when that took place. I would guess maybe 10 years into a marriage of that. I, I, don't, I don't see how it's possible to be any more of that. And he went and he married another person. They've, he's, he's still married her to this, the other woman till this day. And, uh, this relative of mine, since she died a few years ago, I'd, there was just never a time up to her death that she got over that. She lived in bitterness her entire life. And you could see it just like the Bible says, it was in her speech. It was in her life. Um, and I remember seeing events where and it took over. It even took over common sense. I, I remember being at, at a wedding of one of the children. And this was years later. This, this, the offense, this is now 20, 30 years later, that far into the future. And the parents were being seated. And she did not like where she was being seated in relation to the other wife that he'd been married to now for 20 some years. And in front of that enormous church with all those people present at the son's wedding she just went off it was humiliating i mean everybody wanted to crawl underneath the pew you know why she couldn't see it bitterness it was just coming out coming out and coming out and coming out it leads to anger it leads to bitterness it leads to revenge and vengeance is what you begin to seek you become much more worried about restitution than restoration. Remember, vengeance belongs to God, not you. Let him do the vengeance side of the house. We love to do it. You know, it's our, we, we, love, we want to control that vengeance. We will determine what action they get. <laughs> <laughs> Lastly here, it leads to the divorce of relationships. Not just dealing with husband and wife, it certainly leads to that. But in different relationships where you can see where because of a lack of forgiveness that is present, where those who used to be friends, an offense had occurred. The separation happens. The distance is there. It leads to the ending of relationships. And the fact is we all need grace and we all need forgiveness. And Christ said, listen, when you're dealing with others, keep it in, in perspective of what I have done for you in regards to forgiveness. We love to base. Remember what he said, where is it in Corinthians? We shouldn't, those who compare themselves among themselves are not wise. Can't remember the reference right now, but that's, that's a quote of the verse. That's how we treat forgiveness and grace. Amongst ourselves instead of before God. <clears throat> We based our forgiveness because of what God has done for us. That's why we do it. That's why we demonstrate forgiveness. Not because the other person deserves it or, or, or you have categorized. We love to categorize wrongs. And, and put them in categories of the ones that you will forgive, the ones that you won't forgive, the ones you're going to take vengeance for and the ones that you won't take vengeance for. Hmm. But if we remember... 
that we had a debt that we could never repay the Lord. We can forgive others when they offend us. We can. We're here for a short time. Very short time. I'm 50 years old. That's crazy. I mean, it just seems yesterday I was 12 years old out, you know, playing basketball somewhere. Time goes quick. Don't live in that condition. It's a wasted life. It's a wasted life. With heads bowed and eyes closed.